That concludes the backdoor adjustment section. We now know how to adjust for confounding in causal graphs. We'll now introduce structural causal models, which will help make everything that we've seen in this lecture so far a bit more concrete. These will also be important for talking about counterfactuals, which we won't get to in, until later in the course. First, we have structural equations. Uta Pearl is always pointing out that the equal sign does not convey any causal information. For example, b equals a means the same thing as a equals b. There's this symmetry about the equal sign. But for causality, we need an asymmetry. We need to be able to say whether a is a cause of b or b is a cause of a, say. And traditional equations and the equal sign haven't been able to convey this causal information. That's where we get structural equations. So here we have the structural equation that formulates b as a function of a. And here we have that this actually means that a is a cause of b. And we use this different symbol with a colon to distinguish this structural equation from a regular equation. Maybe we don't want that b is a deterministic function of a. Then we can write that b is a function of a and u, where u is meant to be any randomness that we need to represent some stochastic mapping from a to b. This u allows structural equations to generalize the conditional distributions that we saw for causal mechanisms earlier in this lecture. Graphically, we can think of this structural equation as this, where a is a parent of b, and u is a parent of b, and oftentimes u will be unobserved, which we denote with a dotted circle around that node. Structural equations gives us a bit more precise way to talk about causal mechanisms, so we're going to revisit causal mechanisms. Here's the graph we had before, where we are depicting the causal mechanism that generates xi as all of the parents and their edges into xi and the conditional distribution p of xi given its parents. With structural equations, we can formulate the causal mechanism that generates xi as just this. So the variables on the right-hand side of this structural equation are the causes of xi. They're like the parents in this graph. And these are called direct causes of xi because they are directly used to generate xi. So far, we've seen just one structural equation at a time. But if we have a collection of them, we actually have a structural causal model. Here is the corresponding graph for this structural causal model. For each structural equation, we just take the variables on the right-hand side and make them parents of the variable on the left-hand side. And then the variables that we have the structural equations for, the variables on the left-hand side, these are known as endogenous variables. These variables are endogenous to the model in the sense that we are modeling their causal mechanisms. Then the remaining variables are known as exogenous variables. These variables are exogenous to the model in the sense that we aren't actually modeling how they're caused. And similarly, these are the variables in the graph that don't have any parents. We can now write down the full definition of a structural causal model, or an SCM. An SCM is a tuple of the following sets, a set of endogenous variables, a set of exogenous variables, and a set of functions, one to generate each endogenous variable as a function of the other variables. Okay, so that is what a structural causal model is. And one thing that I'll note before moving on is that it is common to not explicitly draw these unobserved u variables in the causal graph. 